My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. History 101, episode 9.1. It's kind of the end of Babylon. Um, but the Babylon episode was already 40 minutes, and I didn't want to keep going. But I didn't want to divide that one up, you know, because it went right from diversity into the Code of Hammurabi. They kind of go together. But in this episode, we're going to talk about how chariots, the new invention of chariots, will divide up the world. And then the world will end. So it should be a relatively short one. So Babylonian warfare and traumatic collapse. That's what our last slide was for our last episode. From 2000 BCE to 1000 BCE. And we have a chariot revolution. Chariots change everything. Remember we talked about armies? That's men with spears. Well, the chariot invented around 2000 BCE is the first super weapon it is a weapon so powerful that infantry that men in arms don't matter anymore and you can actually see this in your bible you can actually see this in in the uh, kings i believe it's chronicles or kings where they go from defining armies by how many men there are king y has 5000 men king x has 8000 men to like ahab who has 300 chariots, 400 chariots, like selling chariots matter and the men don't matter anymore. How many men with spears don't matter because the chariot was so much more powerful than the infantry. So a super weapon, and they come along from time to time. We live in the age of nuclear weapons and we live in the age of aircraft carriers. The first thing you have to know about a super weapon is they're expensive. They're massively expensive. Only few people can own them. And in fact, only the rich can afford them. So only the rich people in a society can own them. And only rich societies can have them, can have enough of them to matter. So only rich people start to matter because they're, they will become the foundation of the military. And you go, well, wait, 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 why, professor? And the answer is, is because those horses, one, need to be bigger to be able to carry a man, to be able to drag the man in a platform. So what is, what is a chariot? A chariot is a platform that you stand on. Two men will stand on it because one will direct, one will control the horses, the other will shoot the bow or throw a spear. So it's a platform. You literally stand on it with wheels that is dragged behind a horse. Well, you need a horse or more likely two horses. Sometimes you'll get four horses. And after four horses, they just get ridiculous. There's, they, you can't really control more than four. Um, but you get two horses. And the idea is that these horses have to be big enough to be able to carry two men plus a um, bronze chariot, a light, what's called a light chariot. It's light because you could, a, a strong man could literally pick it up and put it over his head and carry it if he needed to. Um, but they need, all these horses need grass. And remember, we live in a river valley. We don't have a lot of that. We'll have to grow it. We'll have to convert river valley land from food to grass so that the f horses can eat it. We'll have to build, we have to make hay for them. Well, that's a whole lot of land that you can't use for farming. You can't use that land to create corn or create wheat or create barley. You have to just leave it, make sure that the grass can grow and then leave it for the horses to eat. Well, that, that amount of land is now useless to make money out of. Who can take 10, 20, 50, 100 acres and do that. Only rich people. Only rich people could afford the horses. Only rich people could afford the fallow land to use for grazing of those horses. So, and you're like, well, well wait, professor, you talked about how people didn't have horses anymore. They lost the domestication skill. Exactly. The chariot of all weird things is invented in Central Asia. It's not invented in Mesopotamia. But once, but it's so powerful that when Mesopotamians see it, they go, oh, we need that too. How do we get it? And so what do you do? 
you hire people who know how to domesticate horses. And cities are now rich enough by about 2000 BCE to be able to support the land to support the horses, which wasn't true before. So this super weapon is much more powerful than anything before, more, more than people. So this gives you a new legitimacy. It's chariots or nothing. How many chariots do you have? Which means the richest societies now can build the most chariots and they can dominate the battlefield. And so what happens is you get a big three. You get a balance of power with people you've seen before. And that big three is Babylon, Egypt, and the Hittites. Notice Ur, Uruk, Nippur, they don't matter anymore. They're too small. Babylon is the cosmopolitan city. It makes its money on trade. It has money. It is the trading hub of the world. It connects east and west, north and south. Everybody lives there. It's 250,000 people. It's the largest city in the world. And it makes all of this money on the tax revenue from buying and selling of goods. Egypt is the richest society on earth. It's got the Nile. It has got agriculture. It's got more food than anybody. So it's got money. The Hittites are relatively poor compared to these two. They live in the Asia Minor Mountains. They live in the mountains of Turkey. What is today Turkey? Of what's called Anatolia. Now, that is a place that's rich in mineral wealth. There's a plateau in the middle of, of Asia Minor, which is good for horses. So it's good horse country. But the real wealth is going to be in the mountains. Now, the mountains are terrible for farming. This is why the Hittites are relatively poor. But the mountains are where the cheap metals are. They're where the metals are to build all of this stuff. Babylon doesn't have that. Egypt doesn't have it. Why? Because the giant rivers over millions of years have washed all of those minerals away. Because they flood, they flood the, the valley, and they constantly erode the land. So Egypt and Mesopotamia essentially have no easily accessible um, no easily accept accessible mineral wealth. Mineral wealth, as you well know, where is the coal? Where is the where are the diamonds? Where all of that stuff's in mountains. Like, think about where mining is in America. It's in West Virginia. It's not in Kansas. Kansas is great farmland. It's not great for like mining gold. You want to mine gold? You're in the mountains. And that's just because of of earth science. So for civilization to work, Egypt needs mineral wealth. Babylon needs mineral wealth. And a lot of that's going to come from the Hittites. The Hittites have it. So they're perfectly willing to sell it. Now, the Egyptians will also have access to African mineral wealth as well. You know, up that come up the river. Babylon has to buy its mineral wealth from either what will become Persia, what was known as Elam at the time, or the Hittites. But that cheap mineral wealth allows the Hittites to compete. Their chariots literally cost them less, two or three to one. So even though they're poorer, they're able to compete on the same level as Babylon because they are able to spend, they're able to buy, say, 20,000 chariots for the price that Babylon is spending for like 8,000 chariots. So Babylon has more money. They could build 20,000 chariots. The Hittites have less money, but because the minerals are cheaper, they can also build 20,000 chariots. Do you see how this works? So they're all about equal. And so all of these other peoples, whether they're in the frontier, remember that frontier land that will become Assyria? Like how much independence do you have now? You're stuck with Babylon to your south and the Hittites to your north. Now with chariots, you don't have any chariots. You're in a frontier. You literally went to the poorest place you could find 
so that you would be one of the only people there to start over and hopefully make money by being the first. It's like the colonists coming to America, right? The whole point of coming early was to make as much money as you could by grabbing land before all the other people showed up. Well, now you got the Hittites to the north and Babylon to the south. So you're, you're stuck between a hammer and an anvil. What about um, all the people of the Levant? They're stuck between the Hittites, the Babylonians, and the Egyptians. So you can see why this is a problem. So the world becomes divided between a big three. Now, what's interesting, now what I find interesting is that big three is the big three of the Middle East forever. It's still true. That there will always be a powerful kingdom on Asia Minor, on Anatolia, where the Hittites are. There will always be, Egypt is always powerful. And it's not always in control, but it's always powerful. It always has more people than anywhere else. It's always rich. Always. And then Babylon. Now, Babylon moves. Sometimes it's Mesopotamia. But when Babylon is weak, when when Mesopotamia is weak, it will move north to Elam, to Persia. So when Iraq is weak, Iran is strong. But there's always a kingdom strong in the Mesopotamian Valley or the Iranian Plateau, one or the other. Always. There just is. So this division of power in the Middle East will continue for all of history. So what happens? Well, the apocalypse happens. The world literally ends in what's called the Bronze Age collapse. Literally, the world ended. Civilization as people understood it ended. And this is the first huge worldwide trauma. Every major civilization on earth is burned to the ground, is destroyed. The world enters a, uh, a dark age where different places come out of it differently, but every place goes into a, a sort of dark age. The Greek dark age is so bad. It's so dark. The Greeks actually forgot how to read and write. Like they completely lost. So there's linear A and linear B. Linear A was the pre-Bronze Age collapse Greek. No one can read it. Even today, no one can read it. There's not enough of it for people to read. Linear B becomes the Greek people can read, the ancient Greek people can read. Every major city in Greece is burnt at this time, except for Athens, which the Athenians will always say, ha ha, we were so good. And all the other Greeks will say, but there was nothing there for them to worth burning you were losers of losers you weren't even worth the to go out of the way for and the athenians are like well that's kind of true but we didn't get burned <laughs> and so so what destroys all these people nomads on the move something happens climate change happens so, because why how do we know well we're just anthropology is just beginning to look at it this way but i've been saying this for 15 years why because nomads are on the move what do nomads want they want food so nomads get on the move on their horses they bump into other nomads to take their food sources those nomads get bumped they go looking for food where do they, where do they end up in settled civilizations looking for food and since they can't go back this time because they've just, just got bumped out and they have no food. They have to wreck the settled places that they run into. Settled people move into other settled areas because as the as a nomads come and burn stuff down, you get out of the way. So settled people get on the move and they run into with their with their engines of war. They run into other settled peoples. Every major civilization is wrecked. It is trauma for the settled world from Greece to China. Every, and when I say every, India is so destroyed that Indian history forgot it had a Bronze Age. It's only within the last 50 or so years that archaeologists found stuff from a Bronze Age and they went literally like, what is this stuff doing here? There is no record of a Bronze Age civilization. That's how destroyed Bronze Age 
India was. And we've had to reconstitute what happened. We had to rediscover it. And so it is a trauma for all of those people. See Exodus. Exodus is the story of this. It's a memory of being on the move, of being um, nomadic, of not having a settled place, of looking for a homeland, of not having food. Remember, manna from heaven, of not having food or water, of wandering, of fighting, of constantly fighting. So we will live through basically... um, we are in the third age today. There's an argument that we might be in a fourth age, that World War II essentially destroyed a world, and that since World War II, we live in a new age. But we have seen, in this class, we will see two apocalypses, where every major civilization on Earth is destroyed at some point. And that is this one, the Bronze Age Collapse, where within a thousand years, everybody ends. And... A thousand years. Within a couple of hundred years, everybody collapses. And then there's the 400s, where China, India, and Rome will all collapse. Now, China and India start a little earlier. Rome Rome has a collapse at the same time as China and India, but then it recovers, but then it collapses again. Um, so it's not a straight one-to-one. But by 400, 450 A.D., China, India, and Rome's major civilizations have all collapsed. And there's going to be a, and the new culture, a new restitution is going to have to grow out of that. So, chariots equal rich people. Rich people equal rich societies. Rich societies equal super powerful empires. Egypt, Babylon, and the Hittites. All of them are destroyed along with all the minor cities, all the middle middle power cities in the Bronze Age collapse. When we pick up next, we will talk about the recovery from the Bronze Age collapse of who recovers. Thank you. Take care. Be safe.